Good morning, good evening, and good day. Daja hao. Welcome to a virtual global cooperation training framework on sustainable materials management solutions to marine debris, co-organized co by the United States, Taiwan, Japan, and the Netherlands. My name is Rhiannon Bramer, and I am the Environment, Science, Technology, and Health Officer at the American Institute in Taiwan, and I am pleased to be your moderator today. While the COVID-19 pandemic has precluded us from visiting each other in person, I'm happy that we are able to connect with each other online today to strive together and protect our oceans. Before we start our event, I'd like to share some webinar guidelines for your awareness. Please mute your microphones during the opening remarks. This will help keep all of our communications clear today. Thank you for your cooperation. Now, let's w welcome the four VIPs for some opening remarks from Taiwan, the United States, Japan, and the Netherlands. To start, we'll have Deputy Minister Harry Zhang from the Taiwan Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Director Brent Christensen from the American Institute in Taiwan, Chief Representative Izumi Hirasu from the Japan-Taiwan Exchange Association Taipei Office, and Representative Guido Thielman from the Netherlands Office Taipei. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, good greetings. On behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to the virtual ZCTF workshop on sustainable materials management solutions to marine debris. I would like to thank the Ocean Affairs Council and the Industrial Technology Research Institute for organizing this training program. Thanks also goes to our esteemed partners, the American Institute in Taiwan, the Japan-Taiwan Exchange Association, and for the first time, the Netherlands Office Taipei for joining us as co-hosts. Today's event is the 29th GCTF workshop, the Global Cooperation and Training Framework, also known as the GCTF, was jointly launched by Taiwan and the United States in 2015. Over the past five years, more than 1,000 officials and experts from nearly 70 countries have participated in GCTF workshops. Through the platform, Taiwan has shared its experience and expertise with the region and the world and promoted cooperation on such key global issues as public health, women's empowerment, and counter disinformation. As we proudly celebrate the fifth anniversary of the GCTF this year, we are also committed to taking the platform to the next level. The GCTF Secretariat has been established to enhance the program's management and build an alumni network. We are also working on expanding areas and issues of cooperation. Today's topic of discussion is one of these new areas for the GCTF, and also one that affects all of us. Marine debris impacts the health of the world's coastal areas, oceans, and waterways. It undermines marine biodiversity and navigation safety and poses an underlying threat to human health. And crucially, marine debris is a pollutant whose reach extends beyond borders, so the problem cannot be resolved by any single country or organization. Taiwan is surrounded by ocean. Throughout our history, the ocean has been an integral part of Taiwan's economy, culture, and way of life. This puts us in a particularly vulnerable position regarding the global marine debris crisis. In recent years, the government has adopted a cross-agency approach, working hand-in-hand -hand with research institutions, civil society, and the private sector to address the issue. And Taiwan is willing and able to contribute its experience and expertise to the international community as we collectively seek 
to tackle the problem of marine debris. Once again, thank you all for taking part. I'm delighted to see such an impressive lineup of expert speakers today. I wish everyone a successful virtual meeting. Thank you. Deputy Minister Zhang, Representative Izumi, Representative Thielman, distinguished panelists and audience members, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this workshop on sustainable materials management solutions to marine debris held under the Global Cooperation and Training Framework, or GCTF. The United States and Taiwan have a long history of cooperation on environmental matters, including the growing challenges of waste management. Environmental protection is a priority for us here at AIT. During our AIT at 40 campaign last year, AIT highlighted December as Environment Month and hosted a number of activities. These included the opening of the Global Environmental Education Partnership Asia Pacific Regional Center to improve and promote environmental education around the world. Hosting NASA senior outreach specialists who conducted a workshop for educators involved in the International Science and Education Program called GLOBE that connects students, teachers, and scientists for environmental protection, data collection, and science-related activities, and hosting multiple film screenings around Taiwan of A Plastic Ocean, a U.S. documentary on the shocking amount of marine debris in the ocean. Proper waste disposal is a challenge for all countries, regardless of their stage of development. Of the 8.3 billion metric tons of waste produced worldwide, 6.3 billion, or 76%, is plastic waste. Of that, only 9% has been recycled. Most of the rest, 79%, is accumulating in landfills or is littering the natural environment. Marine debris, mainly consisting of mismanaged plastic waste flowing into the ocean from land-based sources, is another significant challenge. Marine debris also costs the maritime and tourism industries of Indo-Pacific countries hundreds of millions of dollars every year and threatens food security and human health. The United States is working to find solutions to these complex waste management issues, including marine debris. For example, in October 2018, the United States Congress signed the Save Our Seas, or SOS, bill into law directing the U.S. government to increase engagement with countries that contribute the most to the global marine debris problem and find solutions to their waste management issues. We have gathered a number of experts today to share their experiences on innovative waste management solutions so we can protect our oceans and natural environments. I hope that you can take the lessons that you learned from our workshop and bring them into your own work in an effort to further promote sustainable waste management solutions. I'll close by saying that we often talk about the foundation of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship being our shared values. These shared values go beyond our shared democratic values and include our shared values of preserving our planet for future generations by conserving our natural resources, creating innovative economic models and new jobs, and reducing harmful emissions. I hope today's workshop will help you better understand how to incorporate innovative solutions for sustainable materials management for all waste management, and in particular, how we can all work together to solve the global marine debris issue. I also hope that in the future, you will all have a chance to visit Taiwan and see for yourself what a remarkable place it truly is. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests, on behalf of the Japan Taiwan Exchange Association, I am delighted to co host this virtual GCT workshop on sustainable materials management solutions to maritime debris with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Taiwan, the Ocean Affairs Council, the Industrial Technology Research Institute, the American Institute in Taiwan, and the Netherlands Office Taipei. The oceans are common property in order to continue to protect our beautiful ocean. It is essential that not just some countries and regions, but the whole world to come together to work on it. Japan is committed to achieving 
the SDGs and is promoting related efforts at home and abroad, including sustainable resource management. In particular, we proposed the Osaka Blue Ocean Vision, which aims to reduce additional pollution by marine plastic litter to zero by 2050. At the G20 Osaka Summit hosted last year, we were able to share awareness of problem solving at the G20, which consists of the world's major countries, including emerging and developing countries. Japan is now working on the realization of the vision in Japan, we have been promoting the Plastic Smart campaign and we solicit a wide range of views not only from the government but also from private sectors such as companies and institutions. And by mobilizing diverse creativity and technical capabilities, we are advancing all Japan effort. We also have been actively working with the international community. With the help of bilateral OD and international organizations, we will support the effort of developing countries such as ASEAN from the aspects of capacity building and infrastructure development on waste management and we will keep working on the realization of this vision as a worldwide way. This is the first time the Netherlands joins Japan, the United States and Taiwan in co-hosting a GCT event and it is extremely significant to be able to discuss sustainable materials management solutions to marine debris. We will continue to utilize the framework of the GCTF and strive to actively contribute to various international issues. Last but not least, I would like to appreciate the efforts of all those who have facilitated the organization of today's virtual GCTF workshop. Thank you very much. Deputy Minister Zheng, Director Christensen, Chief Representative Izumi, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good evening. It is my great pleasure to join the Global Cooperation and Training Framework for the first time. Marine debris is one of the largest emerging environmental challenges and it needs to be tackled at global level. It requires stakeholders from industrial, political, scientific, governmental, non-governmental and social spheres to act together to preserve our oceans. That is why we are here to share our best practices, to learn from each other and to work together for solutions to marine debris. A non-profit organization from the Netherlands, the Ocean Cleanup, is developing technologies that aim to remove 90% of plastics from the oceans and to intercept plastics in rivers before it can reach the ocean. Later today you will see a video about how the interceptor works in rivers uh, in Indonesia, Malaysia and the Dominican Republic. The Holland Circular Hotspot is a private public platform where government authorities, knowledge institutes and companies intensively and internationally collaborate and exchange knowledge with the aim to stimulate entrepreneurs in the field of circular economy. Mr. Freek van Eyck, Director of Holland Circular Hotspot, will take part uh, on November the 10th in the second VIP panel discussion on circular economy solutions to marine debris. Mr. van Eyck will give you some of his insights from the Netherlands. Ladies and gentlemen, while we are tackling marine debris, the key is starting to reduce the waste and closing the plastic loop. With a cost-effective process, the award-winning innovative Dutch startup Ionica is able to close the loop for plastics starting with PAT plastics. Mr. Boyan Slot, a young Dutch inventor and entrepreneur, founder of the Ocean Cleanup, has successfully developed advanced systems to rid the world's oceans of plastic and there are many more innovative solutions from Taiwan, the United States, Japan and many more places around the world to tackle the issue. Sharing our best practices and let's work together. Cooperation is the key to counter the marine debris issue and therefore I wish you all a very fruitful discussion and I thank you. We are honored to have Charles Chad McIntosh, Assistant Administrator for Tribal and International Affairs at the United States Environmental Protection Agency to deliver our first keynote speech. Chad has over 40 years of experience in environmental and public health protection, both as a regulator and as a regulated manufacturer. Without further ado, let's welcome Chad. 
Greetings. My name is Chad McIntosh. I'm Assistant Administrator for International and Tribal Affairs at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. I greet you all on behalf of President Trump and Administrator Andrew Wheeler. It's a pleasure to contribute to this meeting and to express the agency's commitment to addressing marine litter. In fact, we view marine litter as one of this administration's top environmental priorities. This month, the United States government issued its strategy for addressing marine litter. This strategy is a collective effort of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, Department of State, Department of Energy, USAID, Department of Commerce, and NOAA. Every year, an estimated 11 to 28 billion pounds or 5 to 13 billion kilograms of waste ends up in our oceans, harming marine life and coastal economies. A significant amount of this marine litter comes from land-based sources. Oceans are our shared resource, and it will take all of us working together to tackle this problem to ensure economic and environmental health of our fisheries and tourism sectors. The most effective way to combat marine litter is to prevent and reduce land-based sources of waste from entering our oceans. This means improving waste management and recycling globally. The United States is taking a leadership role in these areas. Recently, Administrator Wheeler re released the federal strategy to address the global issue of marine litter. And this is a strategic model to prevent and reduce land-based wastes from entering our oceans in the first place. This strategy is based on four pillars that define the U.S. approach to addressing land-based and sea-based sources of marine litter. Number one, building capacity for waste and litter management and removal systems. Number two, incentivizing the global recycling market partnership in partnership with the private sector. Number three, promoting research and development for innovative solutions and technology. Number four, promoting marine litter removal, including litter capture systems in rivers and inland waterways. I recognize that the U.S. cannot solve the global problem alone. For this reason, the strategy highlights the importance of working with the private sector and non-governmental organizations to collaboratively fix the problem. Bilateral and regional, regional partnerships are criti of critical importance, and as many of you know, the U.S. EPA and EPA Taiwan have partnered to protect the environment for 28 years by way of our bilateral agreement through the American Institute in Taiwan. This partnership has been a successful platform and an example of bilateral and regional cooperation. Six years ago, US EPA and EPA Taiwan forged a new commitment to advance environmental protection and human health regionally by establishing the International Environmental Partnership, IEP, program. Through the IEP platform, we have implemented global programs addressing challenges such as air quality, site remediation, enforcement, electronic waste, management, environmental education, and other priority topics. I'm happy to report that the U.S.-Taiwan Environmental Framework and IEP were renewed this summer. The new arrangement extends the IEP to new partners such as the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health and Welfare, Ministry of Economic Affairs and Ocean Conservation, and the Ocean Conservation Administration, in addition to the EPA Taiwan. As Administrator Wheeler stated during a phone call with Taiwan's foreign minister earlier this year, U.S. EPA commends Taiwan for your all-of-government approach to collaborating with U.S. EPA. EPA Taiwan should be proud of its progress and the global example it has set as an organization. As I have mentioned, addressing the, green, the global marine litter challenge is an administration priority, and I would like to thank Director General Huang of the Ocean Conservation Administration for the support and hard work that has gone into expanding our environmental partnership to address this environmental priority. We are thrilled to have our marine litter ministry counterparts at the Taiwan Ocean Conservation Administration join this critical exchange and help lead this effort. In the coming year, US EPA looks forward to partnering, partnering with the Ocean Conservation Administration to address marine litter through activities such as the Youth Innovation Council, leveraging our ongoing engagement with the Global Environmental Education Partnership to provide training to environment and education ministries in Asia on marine litter awareness workshops, bringing together partners and stakeholders from across the Southeast Asia region 
to improve alignment of efforts to address land-based and sea-based sources of marine litter. In closing, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present the U.S. approach to addressing marine litter. We look forward to working with you in the future on this critical global environmental issue. Thank you, Chad, for your informative speech about the U.S. approach to solving the marine litter issue. Our second keynote speaker today is Dr. Jenna Jambeck. Dr. Jembeck is a professor in environmental engineering at the University of Georgia. She is the director of the Center for Circular Materials Management in the New Materials Institute and is also a National Geographic Fellow. Let's welcome Dr. Jenna Jembeck. Thanks so much. Uh, it's such an honor to be with you and um, uh, hello out there to uh, pe many people I know from many different countries around the world. Um, and thank you again to the GCTF uh, for hosting me. I don't have much time, but I'm going to talk a little bit of science to start. Um, you know, you heard a few numbers uh, from some of our intro speakers, distinguished uh, speakers, and I wanted to talk a little bit about thinking um, about how much plastic is really entering our ocean. Um, we made an estimate in 2015. Those estimates have increased, but we know it's at least plastic entering the oceans every minute. This graphic illustrates um, concentrations that we see on land and also shows, as we know, we've heard about a few uh, river interceptor projects here and why it's important to look at those as conduits of where plastic is transferred to the ocean. Uh, the pink circles here are the concentration of plastic we find floating in the ocean. And interestingly enough, that is still a small fraction, 5% or less than what we see going in the oceans every year. So um, we're really still looking to see where all the plastic is. But we're talking about solutions today, and this is a framework that I developed for testimony at um, in our U.S. Congress, both to our Senate and House of Representatives. And really, when we think about reducing that quantity of plastic entering the oceans to a zero goal, uh, it opens up opportunities all along the value chain for plastic uh, reduction. Um, and so thinking about sustainable materials management and where this fits in here, we really know from a recent publication that sort of we need all hands on deck here. We need um, even more aggressive approaches than what we've been taking. We've made a lot of progress. And believe me, as someone who was trying to work on this issue in 2001 and said that no one cared about it, we've made tremendous pro progress, um, including the fact that this is now a scientific discipline that's recognized around the world and so many people taking action. So don't take what I mean in that um, we're not doing well, but we need to do even more. And that's what's so great about hosting a workshop like this. So um, with a business as usual, we would look at plastic entering our environment of 20 to 53 million metric tons per year. But with a more aggressive approach, including sustainable materials management, we can bend that curve and, and bring it down. So um, I talk a lot about numbers, but I think what's really important is to think about the fact that this issue uh, so closely involves people. That's, that's why I went in to studying waste management um, and thinking about sort of all the people behind these numbers, um, whether it be sort of the um, independent entrepreneurs who are helping to manage the waste that we generate, the informal sector being uh, inclusive of this sector as we think about making
Hi, everyone. We're having some technical difficulties right now. We're going to come back to Dr. Jembeck's speech uh, in a moment. But right now, let's head into some presentations. So we're going to have presentations from US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Deputy Chief Ellen Ramirez, the Taiwan Indigo's Waters Institute, co-founders Yen Ning and Jason Hu, and from the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, Director Ingrid Geskis. They're going to share some innovative solutions to tackling the global marine debris issue. Hello and good evening from the United States. I'm Ellen Ramirez, a supervisory scientist with the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The NOAA Satellite Analysis Branch has operational desks that disseminate rapid response value-added products to support disaster management authorities and civil protection agencies. An analyst inspects and interrogates the satellite data and transforms it into usable information needed for decision making. Currently, the branch is evolving from only conducting large-scale weather watch operations to developing the capability to detect small-scale hazards like marine plastics, that although are individually small, they collectively pose a major environmental threat. Debris affects marine life, the environment, navigation safety, the economy, and human health. The scope of the threat is not fully comprehended. Here's a diagram of the North Pacific garbage patches. It's a region largely devoid of high resolution observations. There is information provided by mariners passing through, or from cleanup missions, or from in-situ research campaigns, but even still, these sources fail to yield a comprehensive depiction of the debris problem that's plaguing the Pacific. The question becomes, to what extent can satellites detect open ocean debris? Let's rewind to March 2011, when a 9.0 magnitude earthquake struck off the east coast of Japan and subsequently triggered a massive tsunami. NOAA's Ocean Service cites that the government of Japan estimates that five tons of debris was swept into the Pacific by the wave. You can see that this port town has been all but flattened and was partially underwater. In the immediate aftermath, high-resolution multispectral acquisitions revealed that debris rafts were prevalent in the coastal areas. Although the debris was clearly visible to the eye, we analyzed the spectral properties in order to objectively distinguish the various compositions. Each one of the curves in the graph represents the most unique materials that are present in the scene compared to water. We found that one of these curves represented the debris rafts strikingly well. And so we used a specific curve in a target detection application, implemented it on the entire image, and discovered the ability to produce a rapid assessment of debris in a semi-automated fashion. Unfortunately, this procedure didn't translate to imagery collected in the open Pacific because at some point in time, the debris rafts dismantled or became weathered or biofouled and the composition changed. The positive side is that we gained an understanding of how we can respond to marine debris emergencies. Now I will pivot to another source of debris, derelict fishing gear. These are macroplastics in the form of abandoned or lost nets, also referred to as ghost nets. Photo credit is to Ocean Voyages Institute, who posted online these pictures from their latest cleanup mission. These nets can weigh several tons each and entangle several hundred animals. A place where these nets are commonly found is in the Northwest Hawaiian Atolls. At high tide, the nets float into the atoll and at low tide, they snag on the reefs. In 2014, we were alerted to a net that was snagged on a coral inside Pearl and Hermes Atoll. We tasked high resolution imagery and interrogated the visual and spectral properties. This was one of the earliest opportunities we had to obtain ground validation. And here's a photo of the net right before it was dismantled and removed. What we learned was that plastics present a distinct peak in the 840 nanometer portion of the visible spectrum. This is consistent with a 2020 publication from Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK titled Finding Plastic Patches in Coastal Waters Using Optical Data by Bierman et al. 
NOAA's latest efforts include using NV workflows for pixel classification to detect mac macroplastics such as derelict nets. In this case, we're applying a noise reduction transform and parsing out pure pixels, then reviewing which are the most spectrally unique in an n-dimensional space. You can tell by the curve that this workflow identified a single pixel with a spectral profile that looks similar to what we would expect from plastics, yet it's not visual to the eye upon a visual inspection. Our goal is to find more imagery sources with sensors of different spatial resolutions and spectral ranges that collect concurrently so that it's possible to piece together multiple types of information to create a, a larger scale map over a, a wider swath of the Pacific Ocean. The intent is to scientifically report on the scale of the debris crisis, direct future ocean cleanup missions, and promote awareness of the severity of the problem. And now in 2020, we're at the precipice of major breakthroughs using remote sensing to map marine plastics. The sensors are advanced enough and the technology is sophisticated enough. However, it is unlikely that one agency accomplishes this alone. And therefore, we must leverage collaborations and partnerships for resources such as expertise or data. Finally, the scientific findings must be promoted at high levels to non-technical audiences in order to influence policy and promote best practices in order to effectively address the marine debris problem at its source. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Ning. We are from Indigo Waters Institute. Indigo Waters Institute is a consultant company. We are specialized in the environmental survey of the coastal, seafloor, and riverine debris and we also offer policy suggestions for the government. Today, we would like to share the rapid assessment survey and its result. Marine debris has become one of the most serious environmental issues to many countries, especially island states which face endless debris transported by ocean currents. Taiwan, located at the western edge of the subtropical North Pacific Ocean, where the crucial current and China littoral current travel by also suffers from the impact of marine debris. Since this region is the top polluted area of marine debris, and the marine debris is highly accumulated along the coastline, the existing monitoring method doesn't fit our situation. In other words, we need a different monitoring strategy to tackle the problem. Rapid assessment is a method that visually estimates the volume of marine debris on the coastline in a very short time with a limited budget and human labor. With it, we can quickly answer three questions about coastal pollution. First, how much is the total amount of coastal debris? Second, where are the hotspots? And third, what are they? What are the main types of debris? In 2018, two Taiwanese Environmental NGO Society of Wilderness and Greenpeace initiated the first large-scale marine debris survey, rapid assessment of the entire coastline along Taiwan's main island. This year, the Taiwan EPA continues to do another round of rapid assessment. With total 168 sampling stations, we repeat the survey four times. Here, you can learn how we do it from the animation. Rapid assessment is when we look for debris and estimate its total quantity. Taiwan's coastline is roughly 1,200 kilometers long. We've set up one monitoring site for every 10 kilometers. That's 121 sites around Taiwan. At each site, we mark a 100 meter line to sample. Here, we assess the amount of debris, its material type, the topography of the site, and whether it's accessible by a garbage truck. Then we use the volume of one garbage bag as a reference to estimate the amount of debris here. Then we do this many times along the entire coast. After our survey, we have three main findings. Firstly, we found there 
we found that there are 21.6 million liters of Taiwan's coastline and about 60% of coastal debris accumulated in just 10% of the coastline. Therefore, if we concentrate our resource in this 10% length, we can remove about half of the debris on our coastline. Secondly, we found that 70% of the debris is fishing behavior related, including fishing nets, ropes, styrofoam, and buoys. Thirdly, we found that the north-facing coastline accumulates much more debris than others. We assume the northeastern monsoon wind plays an important role. This data helps the government to allocate resources to remove the debris more effectively and to initiate source control policy. In 2020, after we identified the hotspots, the local authority quickly cleaned it up. At the most polluted area, the debris volume has declined 70%. The rapid assessment technique we just talked about can be duplicated and implemented in other countries, especially those who are also suffering from serious plastic pollution. We are happy to share our experience and willing to help. Taiwan can help. If you are interested in getting further information, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you for your listening. The ocean is vast, powerful, filled with life. Sadly, it's also filled with plastic. While many of us are familiar with the dangers of plastic bags, bottles, and other single-use items to the ocean, there is another often deadlier plastic threat. Ghost gear. Ghost gear is abandoned, lost, or discarded fishing gear. Recent studies suggest that it accounts for up to 70% of floating macroplastics in the ocean by weight. Despite fishers' best efforts, gear gets lost. It snags on structures beneath the surface. It tears loose in rough weather or gets tangled in vessel traffic. In places without proper disposal facilities, damaged or worn out gear might be left behind. At times, illegal fishers deliberately abandon gear to evade authorities. However it ends up in the ocean, it continues trapping ocean life, or ghost fishing, for many years, damaging habitats, hurting fish stocks, entangling wildlife, smothering reefs. Ghost gear is the single deadliest form of ocean plastic to marine life. It harms those who live above the water too, threatening the jobs and incomes of coastal communities that depend on the ocean for a living. Today, it is estimated that as much as one metric ton of ghost gear enters the ocean every minute of every day. But there is hope. The Global Ghost Gear Initiative is the only platform in the world dedicated to tackling the problem of ghost fishing gear at global level. Part of Ocean Conservancy's Trash Free Seas program, the Triple GI unites members of the fishing industry, academia, governments, intergovernmental organizations, and NGOs. Together with over 100 member organizations, we develop and trial solutions to the problem of ghost gear, guided by three strategic pillars. Reduce the amount of gear ending up in our ocean. Remove ghost gear where possible. And recycle end-of-life gear and recovered gear. By preventing ghost gear from entering the ocean, we can avoid its devastating impacts altogether. The Triple GI's best practice framework for the management of fishing gear gives actors throughout the seafood supply chain the tools, like gear marking guidelines, recycling case studies, and spatial planning examples to do just that. Together with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the Triple GI has run workshops across the world, bringing together governments, seafood producers, fishers, and NGOs to formulate regional action plans for tackling ghost gear. 
In Indonesia, the Triple GI is working alongside the Indonesian government, small-scale fishers and key supporters on a project to mark gill nets so that they can be traced back to their source. In the South Pacific, the Triple GI is collaborating with the governments of Vanuatu and Canada to trial low-cost methods for tracking fishing gear and identifying ghost gear hotspots with the aim of informing fisheries management policies. In the Caribbean, the Triple GI is working with fishers, fisheries managers and technology companies to address lost gear in local trap fisheries and support effective gear recovery. Another way the Triple GI is tackling ghost gear is by removing it from the ocean and supporting responsible disposal methods for end-of-life fishing gear in ports and harbours. In Maine, working with Ocean Conservancy, the Gulf of Maine Lobster Foundation and 11th Hour Racing, fishers removed over nine metric tons of ghost gear from Gulf waters. This is the Triple GI's single largest removal effort to date. In Myanmar, the Myanmar Ocean Project works with local communities to raise awareness about the impacts of ghost gear, as well as survey and recover ghost gear. In Panama, the Triple GI, the Panamanian government and FAO ran a ghost gear recovery dive workshop, training over a dozen divers to safely remove and sustainably dispose of ghost gear from the ocean. Once considered a harmful burden or waste, end-of-life gear can become a valuable resource through recycling by companies like Triple GI members Plastics Global, Boreo and Fourth Element. In Chile and Peru, Boreo is working with local fisheries to create a circular economy through the collection and recycling of end-of-life fishing gear. Boreo uses the recycled nets to create a variety of innovative products. And Fourth Element have pioneered the use of recycled nylon from ghost gear in a range of products, including performance water sport clothing, swimwear and wetsuits. Our ocean is under threat. Time is running out to turn the tide. But all is not lost. Together, we can work towards a ghost gear free ocean for all. The Ocean Cleanup develops technology to rid the world's oceans of plastic. To do so, we need to not only clean up the plastic that is currently there, but also stop new plastic from entering the ocean. We need to close the tap. Most plastic in the ocean originates from rivers. Our research found that 1,000 rivers are responsible for 80% of plastic entering the oceans. So far, solutions to stop river plastic have been few and designed only for individual locations. Until now. Meet the Interceptor. Developed by the Ocean Cleanup, this is the first scalable solution to prevent river plastic from entering the oceans. This is how it works. The solar-powered interceptors are strategically located in the river. Debris flows into the system while boats are still able to pass. The barrier directs waste to the mouth of the interceptor. Here, a conveyor belt extracts the debris from the water onto a shuttle. Because the system functions autonomously, the shuttle knows when to equally distribute the waste into one of six dumpsters located on a separate barge. At any time, operators can remotely access the interceptor's dashboards from anywhere in the world. Once full, the interceptor automatically sends a message to local operators. The barge is brought back to shore, emptied for recycling, and reattached for further collection. At top performance, the interceptor can extract up to 100,000 kilograms of trash per day. Working together with governments and private companies, we aim to tackle these 1,000 most polluting rivers in five years' time helping us to close the tap and achieve our goal of ridding the world's oceans of plastic. 
find out how to help at theoceancleanup.com. An interceptor is our answer to the question, how do we stop plastic from entering the oceans? Interceptor is a river cleanup system that is designed to collect plastic from rivers before it reaches the ocean. Plastic flows down the river, but the current of the river then pushes towards the barrier. And that guides all the floating debris towards the mouth of the interceptor itself. In the entrance, there's a conveyor belt that picks it up, that takes it out of the water, and then it distributes it with a shuttle conveyor into six different garbage dumpsters, which are located on a barge uh, within the bay of the pontoon. And once it's full, it sends a little alert to an operator on the shore. The dumpster can actually leave the system, sort of like a garbage truck. Then we take the barge to the shore, we get it through the waste management. So that's the whole, uh, the whole concept of the interceptor. Thank you for those excellent presentations. And now, because of earlier technical difficulties, we're going to hear again from Dr. Jenna Jembeck, the distinguished professor in environmental engineering from the University of Georgia. Let's, let's get Dr. Jembeck on the phone. Hi, everyone. Um, Thanks so much. Uh, a great technical team in the background able to bring me back. Um, so I wanted to give a couple examples uh, to be able to um, illustrate some of the points that the amazing speakers and, and videos that you've just seen. Um, so this is Taiwan. I've had the honor of visiting, um, being hosted by the U.S. State Department. And, and there's a great community aspect to the management of materials here. Uh, people hear the song play by um, the collection trucks, they come out, they have direct contact with people who can tell them what is and isn't recyclable, um, putting their own waste within these systems, and then being able to visit the materials recovery facility and see the 17 different materials that things are separated into, I think moving towards um, what we call a circular economy. Next slide, please. And then that means that if things have value, um, you have a, a great collaborative aspect to managing the waste, you end up with really clean environment. So um, this is what I found on the streets of Taipei, which was uh, in, in these locations, not one piece of litter. Next slide, please. 
So we're working at the community level now. A lot of my work has so focused globally, but at the community level, we're working on a circularity assessment protocol in collaboration with many uh, communities, cities, and, and partners around the world. Um, and I just want to give one, one example of this, but it's really a holistic way of looking at materials management in communities all the way from the input of what people are using um, to alternative materials, reuse options, and then to sort of at the heart our materials management system through collection and end of cycle use, and then what um, might be ending up on the ground so we can really then sort of focus on our, our uh, efforts upstream on, on driving change. And of course, this whole system is um, driven by policy, economics, and governance within that. And, and we all, many stakeholders are influencers within this system. So next slide, please. Um, this is a, a few snapshots of us doing this work. Um, we have projects in 10 different countries and 26 cities, uh, again, with many partners, uh, including um, USAID, uh, Ocean Conservancy, National Geographic, and the World Bank. Next slide, please. So I know we have... Um, Many attendees from around the world, I want to give one example of our work with National Geographic where we collaborated uh, people and researchers from five different countries and on the ground partners and collaborators within India and Bangladesh as we followed the main stem of the Ganges River. Next slide, please. We traveled um, 2,000 miles, and if you can just kind of click ahead here, um, you can see the path that we took um, by boat within Bangladesh and then by train and car um, and tuk-tuk and even foot within India. And it was really to look at the uh, load, flow, and characterization of plastic within the Ganges River all the way um, from the sea um, in in the, the wetlands and the delta of Bangladesh to the source within the Himalayan mountains within, within India itself. Next slide, please. And I want to talk about, you know, as we're, we're doing the land-based assessment, you know, um, small villages and communities that don't have, you know, there really is no a way for the waste, or they've actually been using water courses for management of waste. And before plastic was, uh, was a part of the waste stream, you know, some of those practices were okay, but that has changed dramat dramatically. Um, and so learning how to manage this new waste stream, developing systems to do so, and also continuing to look at alternative materials and systems for getting products um, to people and meeting people's needs um, without producing waste. Next slide, please. We were able to visit um, what's what's termed a zero waste community in India, where um, source separation, uh, you know, simple things like separating wet from dry materials, being able to do larger community scale scale composting, um, and recycling everything that has value in some way. Um, here you can see actually they're able to, for about 500,000 people, because waste generation rates are low, store multi-film and layered materials um, up to three to six months um, before um, they're able to dispose of those. So this is truly, again, moving towards that um, circular economy system. Next slide, please. And I think also um, in terms of, of meeting and talking to people who are sort of deeply embedded in the system, whether they be formally a part of a government or informally entrepreneurial, um, you know, really thinking about how you would accelerate that circular materials management, right? They have the knowledge. They know what's valuable, what is being um, bought and sold and, and um, you know, utilized in, in new products and materials. These people have um, the knowledge and expertise, I think, and aren't necessarily always included um, as we're talking about solutions to this issue. And I think um, inclusion and recognition of the work that many of these folks are doing on the front lines of this issue um, is quite critical, I think, to, to moving forward. Next slide, please. 
And so um, I just want to say again today, I think it's such a great opportunity to bring all these partners and the uh, economies together to, to look at this issue, to talk about it. We've heard some, you know, amazing feedback from many people already um, and look forward to a panel discussion moving forward. But we have a lot of potential here that can be realized as we all work on this issue together. And next slide is just a thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jembeck, for that impressive speech.